playing Missy Elliott at the request of our of our guest speaker to get people hyped up for some speculative design. It's just one of the, you know, classic uses of Missy Elliott tracks is getting hyped for sci-fi based design practices. I don't even know what that means, but I'm excited. Let's do it. Thanks for um, playing the music, Daniel. That really hope that got everybody hyped up because we have such an awesome fishbowl while we're shifting. This is not the typical fishbowl that uh, you might be used to. Um, but Raj is going to bring this world building games with us today. So this is going to be a lot more interactive. There's no interval interval for this one. Uh, so welcome, everybody. First, let me introduce Raja Shar, who is a uh, program director and assistant professor of product design at Drexler University, Antoinette Westfall College of Media Arts and Design. She also co-chairs IDSA's Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Council and formerly served as their education director. Raja is an industrial engineer with an extensive background in museum exhibit design and healthcare design. She is passionate about the ways design can make positive impact on social inequalities at the interactions of health equity, environment justice, and STEAM education. Through her research and teaching, Raja studies the ethical implications of design and technology through the lenses of science fiction, speculative design, and social entrepreneurship. Her current projects address the biases of maternal health through wearable technology, and precipitatory design, community-based co-design for en uh, engaging black girls and underrepresented minorities in STEM and STEAM through design technology and dance and biologically inspired design, sustainability and climate justice. Raza received her BSID from Georgia Tech in 2001 and completed her graduate work at the School of Art Institute of Chicago in 2003. Before joining Drex Drexel's product design faculty, Raja taught at the Georgia Tech from 2004 to 2016 in the School of Industrial Design and the Wallace H. Coulter Department of Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech and Emory University. She has been a practicing exhibition designer for 20 years with projects across the country and speaks internationally on inclusive design practices, sustainability, and speculative design. Welcome, Raja, to Fishbowl. Thank you for being here. Please take the reins. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction. Um, Kes, um, hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Um, it's really nice to be able to spend the afternoon with you. Um, it's For me, this week has just been one of like deep reflection and learning. I actually just um, got off of emceeing a two-day conference for the Industrial Design Society of America. Um, we have an annual women in design conference. And like over the past two days, I, I mean, I've been in conversation in terms of like my emceeing and hosting duties, but like I just been like saturated with like, it's not even so much about the skills of design, right? Because something I teach, it's really about all these different approaches to mindset and the way that we think about the world, our lives, the problems, the systems that sort of help support things and the connections between those things. And I am really excited to be talking to some folks who like richly understand the complexity of what it means to think holistically and systematically about the impact of what we do. And so that is really what the crux of my talk is about. It really is about being more intentional about our impact. Um, so for me, when I got this invitation to come and host this, um, and it was specific to the talk that I'm going to be giving today, which will be like part talk and then like mostly game. I'm hoping mostly game. I'm going to, I speak quickly, which is an accessibility issue. I apologize, but it's to get through what I got to say so that we can get into the action because um, the richness about what I'm going to talk about, it really is, it's a design framework that I have adapted, but it's something that I feel like we can really think through and use in forecasting and the modeling and speculating on what the future might bring, um, as opposed to just reacting and hoping for tomorrow, we really are thinking generationally. 
I just want to jump in here really quick while you're doing that, just to get anybody who's not already familiar with uh, the context of this. Ag Agitare, if you're, if you're not already familiar, if you're kind of new to it, is a, a community of practice for people who are trying to use more inclusive, more co-creative, more sort of reflective and, uh, you know, like just better, more effective methods of design uh, on problems that that those in the defense and government space kind of experience. So the fishbowl in particular aims to introduce people to, to some of these new design methods. And, and I found Raja through the Taylor Center. Uh, she did a design thinking breakfast there and it seemed like such a perfect fit. Uh, and, and also there's a lot of overlap between things like threat casting and that speculative design piece is one that, uh, that we haven't had the opportunity to to uh, introduce audiences to. So I'm super excited to, to have you, Raja. Thank you so much for taking the time and, and Cus for, for hosting. Um, just in case anybody was like, why who, why am I in this call? What's Agitare and what does it have to do with you know design? This is our goal is you know partially to introduce people to some of these methods because they are hugely applicable to, uh, to, to many, if not all of the problems that, that we face in the government and defense space, so. No, that was great. I thanks for setting up that context. The name of my talk is Design, Science Fiction, and World Building. And it is a game-based approach to design, ethics, and futures. Yay! All right. So, but really, I'm here to talk about my real love, which I really do love um, design, but I um I like science fiction like a lot more <laughs> because it is inclusive of design and all the things that I like about it. So um I grew up uh in this deep south. And my parents instilled a love of many things in me, um, but ways that we connected, socialized, downtime before the internet was watching movies and TV. And so um, there's one genre that we could all agree on. And it was the ones that, you know, if you were gonna convince your parents to take the whole family to the movie theater, you know, what was going to be on the screen? And it was either movies that represented like black people doing really wonderful things or sci-fi, right? And so that was sort of the frame in which I'm approaching this is like my, my worldview as a kid that didn't have access to the internet at my fingertips and had already looked through the encyclopedia and, you know, they were talking about aardvarks, which is not my cup of tea. You know, how do I experience worlds that aren't mine, right? And we do it through media and through books and through stories. And so the stories of science fiction have always captivated me. And it's been something that I was afraid to introduce into um, or talk about too much as a kid because there, there wasn't like a job in science fiction, you know? You could be an engineer, you could be a scientist, but the idea that you could just make shit up was not really a thing, you know? Um, and then I found this um, field called design. And so, and I'm an industrial designer. And for those of you that don't know anything about um, industrial design or have heard of it, but not quite sure what it is, um, industrial design is just the practice uh, of strategizing mass produced goods and coming up with what those things should look like, you know, what they should be made of and how people might experience them. And there's a lot, lot more to it than just that. But it is something that I always feel the need to clarify because it's from an accessibility standpoint, if you don't know the name of the thing that you might do one day, then it's really hard for you to put yourself there. And so the name of the game really here for sci-fi is I love the stories of sci-fi, but I also really like this idea that representation is critical to how sci-fi is valued for the rest of the world. Um, and, I, you know, and everyone has their own sort of like connections. So I'm just kind of like quickly go through mine and, you know, and I, I just always spend too much time on this one story and then I fly through the rest, but I think this is an important moment. So I'm going to lean into it. So um, growing up watching shows and movies like Star Trek, right? So I was watching like the reruns of Star Trek and I was watching like the 80s Star Trek movies. Um, and there's these diplomatic missions to space. These are they're not military specific, but sure they have blasters and phasers, right? So, I mean, that's like, that's not, the, that's not the point. The point is they're exploring and they're discovering new worlds and new people. And it really is about what is humanity, you know? And this, what is a shared sense of like civilization, 
of right and wrong. Um, sure, there's Klingons and all that stuff, but the themes in there, I really do feel like were accessible to so many people. But in particular, in the casting of the show itself um, and how Gene Ronders sort of set it up was also very intentional. So it came about at the time, at the height of the civil rights movement. This was like on air during height of the civil rights movement in the 60s. Um, and there wasn't a lot on TV. So like there's the same way there wasn't internet when I was growing up, you know, there wasn't a lot to see. So you watch Star Trek, so that's what families did. That meant all families, including black families. And so when Michelle Nichols was cast um, as a crew member, as a leader on this crew, not and not because she was a black woman, just because she was a person um, and she had these skills, right? Um, the way that she was written as a character and the way that she was represented held a huge significance for a lot of people, in particular for um, kids of color, kids with brown skin, black kids growing up. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, is famous for saying that Star Trek was his favorite show and Michelle Nichols' character was his favorite character. Um, and the weight that he felt that her character held is what inspired her to keep going and staying on the show as opposed to pursuing her true love, which was theater, right? So she stayed, she, acting's a job. So her being on the show was like, eh, it's kind of cool, but she had a real love. But the, the role of representation cannot be denied because when she realized the impact of her casting, it was one of the things that really helped diversify like everything that we have done around STEM and space sense, like working and collaborating with NASA to sort of generate and inspire women and kids of color to get into um, STEM and explore all these fields and engineering and figure out how to go up there and, and to set us on a course for actually being able to do this is um, undeniable. And the other thing about it in terms of her representation is it also this vision of like black people being in the future. So for me, um, it was, so many things tied up in it. So I love the stories. I love the themes. I liked um, being able to dream about what our future is in science and technology and design and, and fashion and, and language and all those things. But I also really appreciate the way it was delivered to me. So it's been a, my love and I've been trying to figure out ways to sort of pull it into my work. Um, and so as a, leaning into my identity as a, also a, a, a person who identifies as a woman, um, I also really like strong roles, right? Um, but I also learned a lot from fantasy as well. So growing up in the 80s, one of the big themes was about like climate change and extinction. It was like, we were all gonna die like tomorrow, like extinction level events were gonna happen like imminently. Like it, it was maybe it was the cold war thing. I don't know, but you know, we really got in touch with this idea of existence existentialism and so even movies like the never ending story had me like leaning in and thinking about this idea of like what happens if it all goes away and then also asking the question of what triggers an event like this but the answer was really clear because when you're in the 80s they also were very like literal so there's like the fantasy version of it but there's the fern girly version of it where it's like big business and, you know, peculiar in the rainforest is the reason that we're not going to have anybody. And it was like, you know, in cartoons, it was everywhere. So this saying the rainforest thing really helped me understand like a value of our connection to the earth and the environment. And I, I was like a save the whales, world peace type kid growing up. And I always was worried about, you know, how we were going to solve this. And you know, we also were that be all you can be. Remember the army um, commercials? I'm sure someone in here does. You know, we could do anything. We could solve this. Like, so there was this can do -ness to it. But then there's always like this caution that was in the back of our heads. And so my work in and of itself is really about this optimism for how do we avoid things that when people are left to their own devices um, could lead to like, you know, extinction level events, apocalypses, if you will. And how do we lean into our skill sets to, to sort of like solve those things? And so through my practice as an industrial designer, um, I really do apply um, sort of this definition, which is like using this strategic problem solving process um, to think about the future and to think about ways that we can find the intersections between products, systems, services, and experiences um, and reframe those as opportunities that we can like look across disciplines to solve. 
Um, and so I think that's a beautiful definition. Um, and so one of the things that's really sort of um, inspired my work and in the way that I've sort of framed a little bit of this in my teaching is like looking at real world problems, but then also flipping the script and looking at ways that that plays out or that came to be through the lens of science fiction in books and movies and in television. And so, you know, there are real issues that my field in particular is responsible for. Um, you know, and I, as a designer, we're responsible for the things that are manufactured and sold and bought which means that here we have things that are gonna eventually be thrown away. And the future thinking when a lot of these um, systems came to be didn't, was not inclusive of what happens at the end of life, right? And so because the system was not designed holistically to begin with, we're now having to solve a problem that we created. So what are some other problems that we might create, right? Um, and what, is the, what are those impacts? And so one of my favorite science fiction authors, Octavia Butler, who has written a number of books and a number of movies are based on them. Um, but in particular, there's a two part book series that's supposed to have a third, but she died before she was able to write it. Um, and it was the parables, um, um, uh, uh, it was supposed to be a trilogy, but it's a duo. So the parable of the sower is the first book. Um, and it really a book that transformed the way that I think about the near future. And then it sets up a far future. So the new, near future in Parable of the Sower, which she wrote in the 90s, is set in 2024. Um, and one of the themes that's throughout this is this idea of change or impact, right? We always call it like, you know, impact, right? And, um, and it's, you know, it's beautifully reflected in everything from like change and connection between people, between communities, between um, ecosystems. Like there's no difference in the way we change and the way that we are changed. Um, and so I'm changed by experiences I have and conversations that I have. But I'm also thinking and being cognizant and mindful of the way that I have, I, I enact change on other systems, right? Um, and it's something that we have to think about in, in everything that we do. And so what design fiction allows us to imagine is how can we really speculate on some of these changes in ways that are informative it, they can be entertaining, sure. That's great. Like, I mean, science fiction is inter entertaining. I like watching the movies. It's cool, blockbusters, whatever. But, you know, how, how has it shown up in ways that have not just been um, analytical, but have also been predictive, but also inspirational, right? How has the imaginations of people who lived long ago or yesterday really setting up a future that we are hurtling towards and we are not yet prepared to think about the consequences of. So now we're still going to be cleaning up after it because we haven't really designed the system in which these things exist. We just get excited about the technology. And so, you know, reading books like um, Frankenstein, I read this as a, in my ethics class in um, college, is engineering ethics class. And it was really talking about, you know, bioengineering and the ethics of like, when, where, how, what is our authority over the body? How do we play God? Um, and so Mary Shelley, not having electricity, not even thinking about that, really sort of like in writing this, this story, the story that has like lasted, you know, it is like on every high school reading list, every college reading list, um, which was really asking us like where it was inspiring, first of all, people who were like, oh, can I actually bring people back to life? A, could I borrow body parts, right? Could, I, could the people live doing that? And it's, it was a horror novel at the time, but we literally donate our bodies to science now intentionally, right? So it, it, it informed some horror, but then once we got a system around it, we were able to benefit from it. And, but then you also have like the ugly side of that where you have like people pirating body parts. So, you know, there's this interesting to think about like what these things set up, how we thought about them and ways that we eventually embrace them. Um, and then what has that done to us as a society? Um, I'm not going to go through all of these on this one, but I do think like the earbuds in um, that, so Fahrenheit 451, for those of you that don't know, it's a book um, in a society that is very technocratic and um, it, they essentially ban books um, because it, books are a source of information and people know then they rebel and then you have this thing where people are thinking for themselves and you can't have that, right? But there's also this, there's these things that they're wearing in their ears where they're like always listening to things. So they're like tuned out anyway. 
Um, you know, and there's people have talked about this from the time that we had the Sony Walkman, right? That, you know, kids aren't listening, you know, they're in their own world. And we talked about it also with our mobile devices, right? This idea of screen time and we're like tuning out, but like thinking through this dystopian um, version of how access to technology can enable and like, you know, really help us connect with so many things. But what are the potential downsides of that, right? So there's like always like this flip side to the conversation. Um, that's really, um, I think, tremendous. I, I already mentioned um, Parable of the Sower, but you know, I'm going to leave you know this up, this slide up for just a second. Um, but because in these books, and in, in those movies, and the and the TV shows that are based on them or inspired by them, it, there are hints of the things that we're experiencing now. Right? Um, climate change has always been a theme. Um, genetic modifications. Right? Power imbalances. Um, war civil war civil war is like one of the huge things it's like everybody's having a civil war and it's the aftermath of the civil war or you're you don't know whose side to be on or the rebels or the whatever right so there's always like this um this this moment of conflict where we have to ask ourselves how the heck did we get here right and what i have found in talking to design students is people I, and, it's, and it's unfair to say this but it's not lack the imagination to think much further than like next year. If you ask someone what they're gonna be doing in five years, everybody sort of like blanks and like blurts out an answer. But do you really, like the, the imagining a future is something that overwhelms us even in our own lives because we don't know what tomorrow will bring, right? We don't even know if we're gonna make it to bed on time. You know, what, what, what's gonna come up in the interim? There's all these unknowns. So there's a real discomfort with um, pushing through that level of speculation, which, I believe has hindered our ability to use it as a way of really dreaming. And, but also while we're doing that, holistically looking at the impact of how we dream, right? Um, so the communicator is one of the great examples of how these things inspire, but how so quickly they are implemented. The appearance of the communicator Nine years later, someone saw that and worked for nine years, and we had our first cell phone, 1973, right? So once you put it out there, someone is going to figure out how to make it happen. Because as soon as they are inspired by it, and they see the scenario, and there's good storytelling, it just becomes an inevitability. So if we can dream it, it will be. But should it be? So, and it reminds me of this quote from you know, Jurassic Park, you know, they were too busy asking if they could, if they could, they did, they, I mean, asking if they could, they didn't stop to think if they should, right? Um, so that, that is one of the things that I think is, is super important um, as we're thinking about the cool parts of these technologies. Um, and so, you know, the way that I teach is really to introduce um, some of these themes and concepts, but I encourage my students to access and understand how those things might play out. And we would just talk about it. And so what we're gonna be doing is a game that we use as a framework for how we talk about it. Um, and again, it really is for me at the end of the day, how do we avoid some of these scenarios that just seem really far-fetched and absurd and scary, but yet when you listen to the backstory of any of these things, um, they be, they, the plausibility is undeniable. And so what I lean into is this idea of design fictions. And so design fiction is not about really predicting it, it's really considering it differently. And we and it's about this rich storytelling around objects, pretty much. Like that's the end of it. Like that, that, that is what a design fiction object is. And they be, can, can be, become reality in a matter of days, but it, that, that's the idea. This is a discursive object in which we can like talk about the future. And so it's everything from people playing around with 3D printed selective organs, to thinking about this idea of exoskeletons, which suddenly people get lean into, and we suddenly have like real exoskeletons that are being used for support, but also that are becoming militarized, right? So as soon as it's out there, it just runs, like it, it runs, like there's you can't get away from it. So thinking about how we are connected through telepathy, like that's that's been a huge thing in, in understanding like how we can connect to our brain and then um, to these objects, right? So um, so neurologically connected objects. Um, so where does that show up in science fiction? So like, you know, I'm just talking about this idea of like a neurologically connected device. Um, and then the matrix comes along, right? And what happens when we're 
able to be really efficient at that, right? And how do, and how does suddenly us instead of using technology, technology starts to use us? What? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I love the the application of narrative to just kind of like for me, it's a way of testing what is currently within the realm of the adjacent possible, right? Like just imagine something in like being the case and then think of all of the things that would have to be the case in order for for that to happen um it, yeah we we use uh sort of speculative methods in in design at cyberworks actually in order to to have people hypothetically test ideas come up with a fictional character right and that's your persona and then test your hypothetical solution against that hypothetical character and it and it just opens up a whole realm of like inquiry into the the, the different things that have to be considered i love that and and so when i was when i was talking to raja as we were preparing for this um one of the things we just got and i don't know if everybody read the um the the full LinkedIn description, but what she wrote was perfect. And it says, our actions have consequences and so do design decisions. We currently experience the consequences of past decisions for better or worse. Do we lack the imagination to speculate on the long-term impact the design choices we're making today? Uh, so I thought that was pretty powerful because you know I recently did a uh, design sprint with uh, TSA um, and we were talking about redesigning the uh, TSA pre-check program and, and some of the frictions that we were uh, looking into from some of the research we had done from the users, we're talking about all these friction points that they uh, come in contact with all these security agents. So we're talking about eliminating all the security uh, at the checkpoints. And so it's one of those things where you, when, you, when you're designing, all these small decisions then have long-term impact and what, is, what does that have? And I, I really love how she ties it into environmental. Um, and so, and, and Dan, as we were preparing, both of us, Cindy, both of us uh, thought of you in the threat casting lab and thought, oh, it would be so cool if you showed up. So I'm glad you're here. Yeah, well, and I was thinking, I sent her private notes too. Um, you know, we just did an exercise around the future around disabilities and cool mm. abilities. And so in this very same lens, the that future space is just, I mean, it's so rich because it has to be considered in every single thing we do. And it's exciting, as she was saying, it's just opportunity, so. I think that the level of excitement around the future is a really interesting one too, because I find that uh, the the use of the use of narratives really drives uh, coalition building and the motivation of teams to continue to dive into a problem. A lot of times, that's very narrative based. It's you know like so starting with just. Uh, I, I think actually a ton of innovation efforts have started this way. It was a rich description of a potential future. And that's also, you know, going back to facilitated design methods, that's also something we often do when we're opening exercises, like with, you know, Think Wrong's deflection point exercise. One of the things you have people do is define the future in all of the ways that are potentially dystopian now define the future in all of the ways that are aspirational and in that way you get people really emotionally invested in oh we're actually here to create something that's worthwhile not just incremental right so it, the, the narrative aspect is Hi. one thing that i love about this talk yeah. so this is what i was trying to get to is um it's about it, one of the things i was trying to talk about is you know there's lots of different methods to approach my field and design and bio inspiration, biomimicry, et cetera, is one of the things that's been really catching a lot of um, um, motivation the last, I don't know, three decades, right? I was, teach, I was taught one of these methods back in the 90s. Um, but it's really about taking inspiration from natural systems and looking at them for their efficiencies um, and ways they can connect at the micro and macro level. Um, so one of the really um, cool ways that it's been depicted in science fiction recently on um, the show on Netflix called The One, um, was like, what if you could find your perfect soulmate, right? You know, and we and we think about like, oh, what to find your perfect soulmate? But we 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 try to create these predictive algorithms now through like Match.com and 
I don't like, I don't, I guess tender is not supposed to be considered a, a, a you know, predictive algorithm, but it's trying to think that like, we're going to help you find someone who's going to, you know, make you happy in some sort of like romantic capacity. Um, but apparently there is actually like this, uh, from a, from a, you know, biological level, there's these, they're called, um, cuticular hydrocarbons and it is part of like the pheromone trail of ants and when they are isolating them in this story and I don't know if this is real because I am not um, a biologist but the and, or geneticist but the idea was that that is how ants communicate but also how they connect with each other so essentially that's how they make friends right and so you know if someone's from your colony or if they are the right ant to be talking to because like at the molecular level, like you can, they, they can read each other. And so there's this, there's this whole idea that there's like, you know, this PhD student who like figures this out and then launches this like dating app, in which case, you know, you can identify your perfect mate, which just seems really cool, except that it happens at a moment where people were already paired up with other people that they, you know, were matched with through real, you know, real falling in love, you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter how they got together. So now people are questioning if their partner that they're happy with is their partner, right? Because when you meet someone else, there's like that, that other connection. So it just sets up that whole thing about like what happens and there's so much drama involved, but it's like sci-fi romance drama that's not really that romantic, but it's really like, just makes you think. Um, and then the, the sort of last example I wanted to um, mention before I get into introducing the game was um, you know thinking about this idea of design fictions. Um, yesterday, I watched this movie called The Tomorrow War. Um, and I don't know if you all have watched this. It just got released to Amazon Prime. Um, if you don't know the guy on the screen, that's Chris Pratt. He's Arnold Schwarzenegger's son-in-law. Um, but he's in this movie. I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but you know, let me just say, there's aliens, there's infinite amount of ammo, there's tons of plot armor. Um, there's a lot of moments in time where you're like, come on. But there's also this object of design fiction that I am obsessed with. Um, and see this armband, and I'm just not spoiling the movie, happens very early on. Essentially is a teleportation and tracking device and biometric sensor that is becomes part of um, I guess, how do I say this? The draft. So this movie is set in 2025, so three years from now, and it looks very much like today. Um, and these people come back from the future and they draft people into service and to citizens into service. And in order to do this, um, civilians into service, I'm sorry. And in order to do this, um, to make sure that you don't run, you get tagged with this like armband that has all these sensors in it that are objects of control but also life support and transportation and it, you know it could have been anything it could have been like an implant in the neck you know it could have been a necklace um it could have been a, like a you know a key card you know it, it, the, the object you know doesn't matter but then it does because the questions it brings up for me at least are like what happens if now we're introducing all these like tracking devices um, and our wearable technologies and our mobile technologies that when we start to use those to control people and there was a lot of worrying conversation um, when the vaccine was introduced and people were talking about well how do you know if I have it like are you going to track me you know um, are you and then is there's this idea of a vaccine passport and even that is a mobile device that you could leave at home suddenly had a lot of weight and a lot of conversation and, um, and across the globe, right? Like, does that mean that I'm not going to be able to go state to state? Does that mean I'm not going to be able to go to school, right? How will you know? And then, but I also, I don't want an object that's an invasion of my privacy that allows you to know, right? Or I'm perfectly comfortable with that because I want you to track, right? So it opens up so much conversation around this idea of someone else being in charge of you and they're keeping track of you through some object um but then it's like really exciting because it's like oh but I, you can also teleport me to different places right because it becomes this like emblem of it's my car like this becomes your car this is the car of 30 years from now so like in in some ways I, that has up and by the way the movie is everything about um 
everything about like aliens and very little about this device after it gets put on this person's body. Just, just, just to be clear, this is not the main thing. But I just, I, you know, it, I'm always looking for these moments in these movies that can really help me sort of articulate like why thinking this way, even for a moment, is important. Because it's, you know, aesthetically, it's a pretty cool design. It has to be manufactured. You have to think through all of those details, right? And there has to be some sort of like rationale for it to exist. And someone along the way is going to come up with something like this. And you probably already know that these kinds of things are in development. But I don't know because I'm a civilian. I'm just a college professor. So I just get geeked out about it when I see it in sci-fi. Um, so not to um, disbelieve or that's the point, but I'm curious from um, before we get into the game, I'm curious from the crowd, like, are there any movies that sort of come to mind or television programs or anything like that, that you have sort of been thinking about while we've been talking about um, what I've been showing, sharing? I mean, you can put it in the chat, you can feel free to unmute, but I'm just, you know, interested, like, you know, what's something that's always could have lived rent free in your head that you, has you thinking about the entire world. Oh, Dune and Terraforming, yes. the movies that come to mind or two, uh, one's a show one's a movie um the expanse um in which case they've terraformed uh mars and the moon right and was, by the way the expanse i actually did want to come back to because it's one of my favorite shows but we can talk about that later um but they have you know it, I, when you are introduced to that world it's already we're already there but they are do a really good job at sort of like describing the science and what the innovation the steps in innovation that first of all motivated us to get there uh, outside of just like let's see if we can, um, and why it became, and how it sort of became representation for a whole new race of people that are humans, but not, not earthlings, right? Um, so suddenly you have Martians that are really just like um, a militarized uh, construction force that generates, generate that, that produces generations of people who are super tough and super resilient. It's like the wild, wild west, um, where the only way you can survive is to like, you know, be tough. Right, so it's just everyone is strong and big, and you know everyone goes into um, some sort of like level of service, um, and so and, and and they're still actively trying to do it generations later, and that so it's you know it's not something that happens like this, and they're still living in a bubble. So what happens when a society that grows up in a bubble, with the hope of one day generations from now being able to live on the land, like you know what do you, what happens to that, that group of people and then the other one was avatar <laughs> you know avatar is really about like mining but you know uh that was another one that i'm thinking about like us going into another world that is perfectly rich that we could just move to and then it brings up questions of like what did we do to the earth that we had to do that <laughs> yeah one thing i when i was watching avatar that i couldn't stop thinking the whole time was that fern gully already did this like this is just fern gully with a bigger budget and without robin williams oh right right <laughs> um no I, I thought the same thing but then i was like oh the effects are really cool though <laughs> so you yeah. know it, i think and that's the thing like it, it pulls you in with like it's cool and then it gets you to have the story. And then something else that I've also been realizing as a college professor is that my students haven't seen Fern Gully. My students haven't seen Avatar. I'm gonna be honest with you. You know, like it's the they we the recycling of things is in redundancy and framing it in like a modern context sometimes just needs to be done, right? So I'm just I'm giving permission for that, but same thoughts as a kid who grew up. Um, and when Fern Girl was first released, I was very excited about it. Um, let's see. And then uh, the first Iron Man movie. Oh, oh the AR displays. Okay, so um, Dylan, what, tell, tell us about your fascination with Iron Man. I just remember being really inspired because um, I was a lot younger uh, when that movie came out. And I just thought that was like the coolest thing. And to see um, like steps to go to that with the augmented reality of like Google Glasses or the virtual uh, reality steps that we've taken. It's just really exciting to see and then kind of being able to see the progression from, wow, that'd be really cool to, oh, that, that's actually possible. Or it's in the other conference room and you have to use it and it doesn't work quite well enough and it takes forever to set up, right? <laughs> like, you know, like it gets to the point where it's just like, oh, it was cool and now it's a chore. Like, I, you know, 
that's like you know when it's the, the, when we're post 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 AR when it's squishy, right? Um, and I think that I had the same reaction playing order report. Like that was that was for me the thing that really in, convinced me that teaching in this way was like I had to I had to incorporate those lessons in my work. Um, the, the you know the, the predictive um, pre crime right, which was like from a from a like a I would say like a civilian criminal justice standpoint, this idea of, dude, how can we have confidence in authority over algorithms that we are producing or, or in this case, clairvoyant people, right? Um, but we, and we, and is, is because, is it, and is it faultless, right? This idea of how much trust we can give over and this idea of faultless and also predicting crime, which is what we're talking about now with the conversation over augmented reality specifically um, in, in, um, in like facial recognition and the ways that it sort of like pushes biases across society, which is criminalizing people because it's not, because, they, because it's not fault, faultless. The technology itself is not faultless. It is designed by people, right? So there are, there are going to be errors. Um, uh, Tenet, uh, Daniel, tell us a little bit about Tenet. Oh, I just watched it for the first time on the airplane over here. And it if you haven't seen it yet, it's about time travel. It's about sort of it, the assault of the future on, you know, on the present kind of, and people using using it as in uh, in in these sort of uh, nefarious ways. Um, and it's also about like, who controls technology, which is something that is, you know, really interesting to consider as something requires significant resources. Oftentimes there are a very specific, there's a specific sort of cohort who gets to say what is uh, a productive or, or, or who gets to use this and to what end, which is a really, I think a really important consideration for all technology, like, Who's this for? Who gets to say what is a, an ethical use of it or not? And that, that, I think um, the, the idea of like, you know, who is in control, who has power, um, you know, who, who's vulnerable is like a theme that I see in a lot, a lot of really great, rich, the better stories in science fiction really do set up that question. But, um, you know, the other part of what you're saying um, in terms of not just like authority, but like ethic ethics is a large part of why we talk about this because ethics is something that's sort of codified by a society. It's like, you know, what is accepted? And, and we all see that laws change day to day. You know, it was criminal to possess, you know, cannabis five years ago. And now it's like legal in half the country or 16 states or whatever it is, I think 17 now, right? So, you know, it's, and so now suddenly it's like, oh, it's cool, it's fine, you know? Whereas before the, the judgment of not just like society, but like, you know, it, it, the, the penalties were severe. People have been thrown in jail for like the rest of their lives for like, for, for like holding on to something, not even like necessarily doing anything with it. Um, and now we're saying, oh, it's beneficial. You know, let's use it for cancer patients. And it's, you know, and it, it, it so that the shift of society and society changes, um, is also something that shifts, you know? Um, and so what do we value? And being reflective of that all the time because your values change as you have more information and have new experiences. And then this, and then likewise, like that is filters through everything, through education and government and the military, right? Um, yeah. Let's see, there's the, one's another one, um, Black Mirror. So Tess, tell us about Black Mirror. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if you, or you, you watch it. It's a series on Netflix, and I believe it's a British production. But basically, it doesn't seem so far-fetched. Um, that, that's what scared me the most. But it's basically the uh, taking societal issues and just exaggerating them to uh, an extreme extent through technology. Um, and it really kind of, for me, it seems more of like a manipulation of like, like a, the evolution of a society um, based on someone's positioning and use of a technology against the other. Um, I love the word manipulation. I'm just, yeah, I have to like, I'm like letting it soak in because I think that that is, that's, that is what we're doing. <laughs> I mean, that's what yeah. I want to do. That's how I want to think about it. 
but it sounds so sinister but in fairness it, it does but then when once you kind of like peel back the onion on it um and you watch the series i just felt like every the the main characters were just being completely manipulated uh and there's there's one specific episode where uh all the uh members uh, are being manipulated to do things they don't want to do uh and end up one end up one um character ends up killing another based on this manipulation that they were put into and so it's just for me, it's it's not so far fetched as like Avatar, um, so it's closer to um, you know because you see people using technology and changing their behavior and running into light poles, walking down the street because they're so tied in. Uh, so it's not that far off, you know. So so Black Mirror is is a good one for me. And I think it's there like, was an episode that was like a, about social media that is like legit what China's doing with like you know your the um, your social credit score. You know what I mean? Like it's. It wasn't even far fetched. It was like, oh, that's right there, you know. Oh, and it's happening in commerce too. I would recently went to a store which, that, like, everything was zoned off. You couldn't buy anything, but you could see everything. And then you had to go to register, and then they checked your status of the store. And if you were a higher status, you got access to the goods at a sooner date than others. And then it's really interesting to think about the mechanism of storytelling there, which is often very simply just how could we look at enablement as vulnerability? Like everything that makes you more capable of something, the, if you increasingly kind of invest yourself in it, it opens you up to be more vulnerable to potential downsides of that thing. And that could be said of m like many technologies. So just as a, as a design mechanism, I think that's really, really interesting. I don't know if you guys noticed that my um, my internet just went out again, but I'm on my phone. It's working fine. So it's just my computer. So what I what I what I want to do is I forgot um, I forgot the order that we were going in in the chat. So I think we just talked about Black Mirror and I plus eleven to everything that was just said. I don't want to like get too far away from um, from from the chat um, before we move on because I'd like to honor like the contributions of everyone. So who is next? Can someone help me? Yeah, so. And then also I'm gonna uh, ask a favor. Um, Cus, would you mind um, sharing the um, Miro board? Um, sure. Cause I can run it, but my it's up on my computer so I can still run it. I just, I don't wanna share it for fear that it will um, fall. Perfect. While I'm doing that, Daniel's gonna talk about hoverboards. Oh, I was just thinking of things that weren't more recent and and I just remember seeing the hoverboards in Back to the Future and it being like, that is the future I want. I want hoverboards so bad. And then when we actually had, you know, like what they were calling hoverboards come out, it was like a huge disappointment to me that this is what we finally decided to call hoverboards. They have wheels, like that's not hovering. That's a, you know, so uh I, I was just realizing that i have a lot of emotions kind of wrapped up in the back to the future hoverboard so and like the expectations right i mean and i think for a lot of us that you know the promise of the future you're like oh it's just kind of a new social nuisance in some ways um yeah but it's really great for for, for videos right <laughs> like and the use of it is not what we thought you know it's like oh the people that are actually using it is, is like you know, anyway um yeah. all right who, anybody was next who was next I didn't put anything in chat, but honestly, for me, while I've been sitting here thinking about it, the only thing that keeps coming in the brain is all of the fashion in sci-fi is what has always, well, no, let me start that over. The fashion in sci-fi is what drew me in initially. So when I was in junior high, high school, it wasn't the sci-fi part that grabbed me. It was what everybody had on. And that was particularly interesting to me because, you know, this is, you know, 90s next generation. So, you know, their clothes were doing things. And to me, that just, because at that time I wanted to be a fashion designer in my life, which I did not end up doing, but, you know, that technology of the wearable concept for a girl from super rural Michigan, I was just like, that shit could happen. And, and why that's particularly interesting to me, because 
I came from a very, very small rural community and imagining getting out on a spaceship seemed doable all the time, but the imagining of the sort of autonomy, so it wasn't an environment, it wasn't a, a, a ship, it was something that you would just put on and then you would become. And so I think for me, that is what really drew me in more than anything. It was like you put a costume, this magical thing did stuff. Okay, so as someone who is a big sci-fi person, I really love cosplaying, so I go to conventions. I used to, I will still one day, um, sci-fi conventions. I mean, but you're, what you're describing is like, first of all, it's like you can become, the idea that you can become by putting on, like, you know, how we embody so much and what how we dress, but cosplay is mm -hmm. like an industry, right? Yeah. Like. Yeah. And it, it is a it is a skill in and of itself and it is interdisciplinary and it is about fashion it's about the construction of these things it's about the storytelling it's about the technology that you have to do to get it to, to represent all those ideas and it is about like this personification of what i mean real cosplayers don't come out of character right yeah. once they put it on they become um and like the mindset that you have to be in doing that how you interact with people like I, it, it, it's the same as the people who are coming up with the worlds. Like I, what you just described, like it is how, why I'm so impressed with cosplay. I am like a, I'm an amateur cosplayer. Like I just like, like wearing the costumes and I'll, and I'll giggle while I'm wearing it. So, <laughs> you know what I, mean? so I play, um, but I'm really appreciative of the people that take it super seriously. Yeah. I like um, so costumes. I can't do all the work to get on that pro level. That's, that's more than I can operate with. <laughs> Oh, okay. So that actually, that brings up something that I, that I, I had a weird uh, realization, like an epiphany one time when on a, on a lark, I went to a BronyCon um, in Baltimore. Uh, and if you're not familiar, BronyCon are, are adult fans of the show My Little Pony. Um, and many of them are just quite sincerely, it, just super fans of the aesthetic and the, the sort of innocence of the show. There's if, if you've never watched the show, it's actually kind of a remarkable show. I was never like a super fan, but it's it's really interesting. Like they, they have this alternate reality and people become super fans of it. But there's something I realized that I loved about my, you know, what I call my nerd friends who are just, they're unapologetically passionate about a single thing. And that is that when they are with their community, there's this, there's this ecstasy of authenticity of, I don't have to worry about my what people think about how much i love this one thing right and and society shuns that that you know there's a there's a stigma around it or people like to say oh it's purely sexual they're probably perverts right but you know whether there is it is sexual or not i i don't think we should reserve judgment for that anyways but the uh, I thought it was really interesting. And I think it's something that extends into sci-fi and cosplay. And it's something I like to bring up every time I hear people talking about those, those niche communities, which is that uh, most people aren't that passionate about anything. Like most people who are not into those you know, com communities, they have trouble, they're held back from realizing their true passion for a certain thing because of the constraints of society. And so that's just like, it's a really interesting theme with the sci-fi thing, with the cosplay theme, with the brony thing, with you know, with Comic Con, like that. These communities allow people to express themselves and actually get into something. They provide that safety that actually extends well into the field of design because you want people to fully invest themselves cognitively and emotionally because that's where the the most inspiring things are going to come out, right? So. And, and, and I, I want to, um, I, I want to like plus one that because I think that that is the conversation that we've been having for the last year and why the field design as a field as a practice hat is, is going through some shifting and changing now in that it has not been inclusive. It's because people have not felt, even people that have been privileged in the field have not ha felt that sense of authenticity. So as people who don't live in that privilege definitely are not bringing their full selves, right? 
And if we can live, it, if we can lean into our full lived experiences as people from rural Michigan or from the South Georgia, um, based on race, gender, upbringing, you know, our values, our morals, our aspirations, um, and bring that into the practice of our disciplines as designers or whatever, whatever your whatever your discipline is. Um, you know, it, it, first of all, that doesn't make it easier, but what it does is it helps us really be more critical about the pra that practice and to figure out like how it can be more productive of people. Um, and Michael had a comment in the chat. Um, uh, Michael, I don't know if you have, uh, oh, oh, and then wrong, I, I just get wrong, sorry. Um, uh, you know, did you wanna um, unmute and say anything about that? I don't wanna lose you. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. So, hi, this is Ron. Uh, one thing is we keep talking about the Internet of Things and, and all of that, but we have to think about human centered futurism, right? So, just because we can and we create, you know, all those things that are attached to our body or whatever, it doesn't mean that we as a society agree that that is kosher or this is acceptable or not acceptable. So one thing that I like to talk to people all the time is let's, did we have a chance to say whether this is acceptable or not? I mean, technology and biotechnology evolved much faster than we do as a society. And all those new things that are out there, we have not had the chance or the opportunity to talk about it as a society and decide as a group, this is acceptable versus that is not. I hear a lot of, you know, internet of things. I want to hear about internet of people, right? Uh, and I actually, maybe that's a great segue into our game because I, what, what, one of the things that this um, particular exercise was inspired by or to move in this direction was I'd work with a colleague, um, my friend Chris Baeza, who's another professor at Drexel. Um, and we're, we're both just, um, I guess, these systems thinkers who are in boxes that don't, aren't really made for us. And we're like, but all these things are connected and no, no one gets it. No one gets it, you know? Um, and somehow or another, we came to the conclusion, and that's what has been in the background, sorry. Um, they came to the conclusion that we needed to really create an ethics framework that was more inclusive of a lot of these themes. Cause everything was sort of compartmentalized. Like, oh, sustainability over here, human centered design over there, right? These things over there. And how do we just bring it together as a tool that can be both analytical um, and also, I guess, propositional. So I like that you brought that up. I'm going to um, go, what I want to do is I'm, I'm going to let, we're going to play the game because I don't want the screen share to go away, but I have an, actually another link that I had pulled up on my screen that I was going to share um, where I was going to show you that because that's also a mirror board that we have. But let's, why don't we transition into this game? I'm going to introduce it um, because I know that the, the video is not um, there. Uh, I, there was supposed to be like a little intro video that was in my, um, <laughs> that was actually in the PowerPoint. Um, so this is a game that is based on um, another workshop that I attended last summer. I attended it virtually. It was um, put on by um, the the future, I forgot, Design Future Center in LA. Um, and they brought this group called, um, uh, was Afro Rhythms of the Future and also um, the Fathomers, which is just like this group that is game-based um, design exercises. And so they come together and they created this game called Afro Rhythms of the Future. But the way that the game works is it really is an interactive world building game that's really based on conversation and a deck of cards. And what I've done is I've, I've sort of taken, like, you know, playing the game and having a lot of excitement about it. And I turned it into a Miro board that introduced some of the themes we've been talking about in my classes, um, which was like super important for me to be able to articulate and share to my students, but also use it as a moment of just like discussion. But it's a way for us to think about the future and generate ideas through the lens of humanity and society um, and, and putting those tensions there and then having us manipulate, am I using that right, Marcus? Yeah, <laughs> I like it. Manipulate um, tensions and pushing them towards, you know, dystopic um, and like optimistic um, lenses. So go ahead and share it again. Um, if you can, and I'm going to just watch here and I'll, I have like, you know, five, 15 screens in front of me. None of them stay on. All right. So this is the, the way it works and hopefully it'll work out. Okay. Um, even though you guys don't have the full introduction, 
but it the the game it doesn't matter what the game is called this is what we're doing we're building a world the world is here right right now and um what we want to know, know is like um what are the key tensions of our world or our universe right so we, we were going to do we're going to design it um and so we have some options to think about in terms of like what we call tension cards and these are like what's happening in the world right now thematically and the ones that we see here are just they're ones that we just sort of came up with as we were thinking about the things in our own class but in terms of like ways that I would love for the audience to think about how they might use a tool like this is like putting the things that are important, um, you know, to your practice, right? So, you know, we've been talking a lot about sort of like how, you know, systemic racism, you know, gender, uh, this idea of moving around migration, social justice, ecotopia, public health, privacy, income inequality, technology, liberation, you know, blah, 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 right? It can go on and on. Um, but you know, what are two themes that just are constant right now? And so what we can use this board to do is like, we watch like a movie and we kind of like see like, what are some of the themes? And you can be like, oh, it's time travel and plot armor. Okay, well, that's not the things, you know? It, it, you know, it really is about, you know, oh, it's, it's really about climate change and, um, and invasion. Great, great, right? Mm -hmm. So alien invasion and climate change, great. So those would be your two tensions and you'd probably have them pre-populated. Um, but what we're going to do is you all are going to help me pick two of them that we're going to use to sort of like build our world together. Um, so that's the first thing that we do. Um, so you see the ones that are here and pretty much the way it works is the just, just blurt out or write in the chat, whichever ones you want. The first two I see are here. I'm going to pull over and those are going to be the parameters uh, which we're going to use to sort of like think about this future world. Woman so, leaders. Um, what did you say? Which one? Woman leaders. Okay, got it. Nice. Pull <laughs> this over here. Let me put it up here. Wow, I went too far. I'm going to bring it to the front. Sorry, I got to do all this. All right, and what's the other one? Did we have one in the chat? All right, I'm saying public health. All right. Y'all didn't go, all right. I'm taking it. <laughs> go for it, Cindy. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Like, I love it. I love it. I like it. All right, so those are the parameters of our universe, but we haven't really decided um, what uh, what public health or what women leadership means. So this is what we also have to do as a group. We have to define what that means when we say a world that is really sort of like constrained, or these are some tensions that are at play or things that are sort of like ubiquitous. So I'm interested to know from you all, like what does women leaders look like? And, bef and this is before we even establish like the, the degree in which women leadership shows up in this world. Let's figure out like what it is. And so that's where I take notes and you tell me what you think. So what is women leadership? Women's women lead. I'm not speaking up first this time. Men folk. <laughs> more nurturing. Nurturing. Yeah, so more feminine versus masculine. So nurturing. Okay. Feminine. I got to spell right. I, oh yeah, also I'm a bad speller, so I don't really don't. I I'm I'm okay with being a bad speller, so you can correct me, but don't worry about it. Just spit stuff out. What else does women, what else does women leadership bring to mind for you all? I'd say more collaborative versus competitive. Okay, I'll make that smaller. Someone else. We'll Less. just put a couple of features up here before we get going. Less ego. Okay, got it. Be oriented. Oh, Harley, what did you say? Community oriented. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I heard you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm late. No, no. Okay, cool. Give Disrupt me. Disruptive. Whew. 
I don't know how to feel about that, but I'm neutral in this. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just the game runner. I'm interested if anyone has to, um, I mean, all, and I think also as we're talking about these, as you're thinking about um, how you might critique any of the things that are up there or explain in a way that you're interpreting it too, I'm happy to take those notes. And I just realized there's something in the chat, so I'm gonna copy that. Um, hopefully it's working before my computer crashes again. And to be clear, it's disruptive compared to like traditional leadership. Okay. Like disrupting the status quo. There you go. Yeah. Okay. I think someone said mutual empowerment. That's okay. Um, and mutual empowerment. Now I like that one, but I'm I'm neutral. <laughs> and I know, is, is, is it always true who knows like we're just putting these things up there right how about um, um like being able to set boundaries like being more sensitive about setting boundaries ooh, boundary setting and to be clear i'm terrible at setting boundaries right but i am disruptive in meetings um so but we're talking about just something status quo. So I'm going to put that up there for now, um, and we can talk about how much we want. Let's let's just define public health really quickly, um, and then then we're going to establish where where our world sits between these tensions. All right. So then the question is, what does public health look like? So same thing. Just spit stuff out, and if it's in the chat and I'm not looking at it, just someone else read it out too. Yeah, because I think Daniel's um, mic doesn't work. Uh, Easily accessible. Oh yeah, and available to all. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and then I'm gonna ask a follow-up question there. What is what is access? Because available and accessible are two different things, right? Um, so what? How are we defining access before we get too too far away from that one? The convenient. Mm -hmm. Meeting needs specifically in you know our ADA way where we recognize public health means we meet them okay I think we're trying to say it's it's a uh, right like a human right yeah I'd say less constrained by individual conditions and 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 mark only constrained by larger systemic conditions i think public health also when you hear that it sounds like the collective it's everyone's health i i also like the word um community too i think it reminds us that public health is about other people in our community and it could be bigger or smaller but i should not talk because i top talking about that collective and i'm going to put in the world community but daniel griffith just put feeling safe in public I, I think it's interesting that the feeling of public health is is more being part of something that's being cared for And I, I mean, I, and I think a lot of this, the, I mean, these things I'm thinking about, you know, do reflect on things that were happening today. I, I was just talking to someone about this idea of feel, being able to trust. For me, it was like being, public health looks like trusting, trusting people to, to be empathetic, right? Marcus also wrote utility and quality of life. Yes, yeah, so I just lived in Spain for six and a half years and there's a confidence that radiates from the Spanish culture because their health care system is so good that they have this like, it's like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs like are just met to a higher level for them. So they're just have this um, relaxed sense um, that their their health is is a utility rather than something that they have to pay and fight for. That makes sense. Oh yeah. yeah. It's like stress. I'll put that up there next to right to utility too. You already right to right to. Well, I think you get go ahead, Cindy. I was just gonna say, I mean, putting down the ability to relax and the peace of mind, 
that's making the assumption that public health is going well. Well, we haven't defined how good it's going. We're just defining what are some attributes. So we can, we, 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 we're going to do that in just a second. So I'm going to, I'm going to put just mental health up there because you mentioned that um, because mental health is part of public health, right? Um, and then, you know, the way this is, the way this goes is you kind of do this and this can be an exercise in and of itself in terms of like trying to define the context and people will get into, it's like accessible sidewalks. It's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, inclusive classrooms. It is, you know, free, free healthcare. You know, it is government, you know, it is like maternity leave. So people just based on like whatever their experience is, we just invite them to just like add to that definition if that's what public health is. And it's not even saying if it's good public health or bad public health, it's just saying like, what are these markers? And I think in a real like design workshop, you can take this and break it up into, you know, affinity diagrams and really start to clump and, you know, dive in. So I think that, that gives us an opportunity to do that. So now we kind of know what the definition is. The question I have is, where, are we living in a world, in this future world, where it is the most possible women leaders um, and women's leadership or how we're defining that? Um, or the least possible, you know, you know, how much does it show up here as attention? And then at, also doing the same thing with public health, you know, are we living in a world that has maximum public health or, or it's absent? So, and you know, the, I like to work in extremes because I think that they can be really interesting in terms of those manipulations, but I'm happy to hear from the crowd and just pick a number and I'll just decide like where it goes, like that is pretty how much what we're doing. Pick a number, any number. So for women leaders, zero or five? We mean zero, one, two, three, four, five. Five. Okay. So we're living in a world where there's the most possible women leaders. Um, how does public health show up in this world? Is it absent um, or it is the most possible? Three. Okay, so, um, and then, I think it's nice to have a reference for today. And when we're talking about where, wherever you live, where would you rate today's public health on a scale of zero to five? For where I'm living in the States, I don't know where people are calling in from. Well, in a, in a military context, it's, it's five, but culturally I'd say the United States is, is kind of at a Mm, maybe two to be generous. Wow. So, okay. So we're talking about like less than what you might experience, but more than what I got. Okay, good. <laughs> so, so, so it's a little bit, so to me, I can sort of think about this optimistically in, in that case. So a three is an improvement over general. So it's a little bit better than what we have now. So now here's where the game gets interesting. It's really quick after this. And it's just this idea of taking an inspiration card, an object card, and then thinking about like what they are in this world. So we live in a world with the most women leaders you can have. All, all the leaders are women. Everything is run by women. Men, men are not in the C-suite. They're not running countries. Um, they don't show up, right? And we got a little bit of public health. So then the question is, take an object and then we take an, um, an inspiration and we pair them and then we just brainstorm. That's, that's the game. And then as we're brainstorming, we're going to talk about it until we run out of time in seven minutes. So let's just take um, two things. Pick two. Um, fashion, I mean, I'm sorry, pick a blue and pick a yellow. Uh, the, what is the bottom row of the blue? I oh, it says decolonization. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we got fashion. Is the blue one? Okay, and I think somebody would appreciate that. And then um, give me um, an object. So fashion is is the inspiration. What's our object? Like we have, looks like we have apps. Apps, all right. So what do fashion and apps have to do with each other in a world where public health is a medium priority and women are in charge? 
what are the apps look like? out what are we doing are we yeah right yeah we're spraying okay. brainstorming so, i'm gonna start typing yeah well, they can role model and you wearable art, wearable apps that care about health. Okay, wearable app. You can have a wearable app that cares about health. And it's Give special. Me <laughs> also, um, I think the fashion app piece comes with human beings that can be a part of the cause the support all of those pieces so like fashion influencers who help but in a, a sort of new way you know so you have like the health field tweaking that for product releases of things like vaccines and so really interesting partnerships okay so we got fashion influencers who are really trying to support health related innovations we got people that are working on behalf of healthcare causes um digital fashion that can be changed in a in a moment oh okay is this so when you say digital, Daniel, do you mean like virtual? Yes. Okay. I love okay. Dig, oh no, you digital fashion. Digital fashion. So we can actually have multi-purpose clothing that can be adaptive too. But one of the things I'm thinking about is like if fashion and health come together in an app, like can if we are hurt, can the our clothes be therapeutic? So I'm gonna put therapeutic clothes. Or can our clothes help sense an illness? Yeah. So we're therapeutic, responsive, right? Or if our clothes so adapt could, our, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, if our clothes could be like protective. So if it says senses like where is a imminent impact or something, it like puffs up or something like that. So protective. There's right? actually a, a, uh, a woman ran company in, in England that developed a uh, invisible helmet for bicyclists and they put airbags in a shirt completely ran by all women so exactly so this so the way this works is in three minutes we have collectively come up with ideas that could support industry around fashion and ways that support this middle level of public health right uh, oh destigmatizing health conditions oh my gosh i love this it's a clothing that de-stigma, I can't spell stigmatize, but I'm gonna have to, I should just uh, stigmatize. I'm entirely sure I, I spelled that correctly either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was like, oh, I was spelling it differently, but I don't, I, I'm, a, I'm agnostic um, about spelling as long as people get the idea um, and not give up room. Oh, we have uh, virtual filtration. Oh my gosh. And then the other thing, um, or viral, viral filtration. Oh my gosh, I love it. Because, you know, as we're thinking about these ideas that seem like this future for a world that is not our own, and we're thinking about it through just a slightly different context, this idea of like women are in charge when they weren't before, right? Um, it just makes us think about just slightly differently than what we see coming up now, right? So um, I don't, I wanna, I know we have only have three minutes left, but I feel like you, you all did an amazing job. <laughs> generating these ideas right oh i see also see affordable fashion solutions right so there's a priority on like making things accessible and affordable because we just said that public health is also accessible right so if there's benefits in the clothes that can help us with our health then those benefits need to be accessible right and um the other thing that i was thinking about with women leaders in this context is if it's really about um being community oriented are they not sh pushing to be at level five when it comes to public health, right? So if that's if if that's the case, if it really is about um, mutual and empower empowership, empowership empowerment, I think, and um, and community oriented like approaches to leadership, then there might be like investment in healthcare education and public health education and all these things, so that it'll eventually push to a five. Okay, um, I don't know if that, that makes any sense, but. They're like improving a, the infrastructure of the society. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, so that's, 
that this that's how the game is played and so I, i'm gonna move this out of the way so we have room because this is like kind of whatever so you kind of can just do that and so you saw that once you get the world established and you discuss that and you can spend as much time you want on there um just pairing those two things and kind of like putting people in breakouts or doing it as a group you just start to generate a lot of different ideas and i think pushing and manipulating um you know the the, the level of the tensions really does help us get out of thinking about it today and really just free it frees us to think about in ways that don't seem possible or plausible now um and then it ideally it would open up more discussion to critique it from an ethical and um, user centered standpoint um and so i have um a, another link to a larger board that um, about this game that includes a paper that I'm going to put into the chat. I think I, it's going to stay stable. It seems like every time I paste something, Zoom crashes. So it's a second board that I have. Um, it is um, based on a, a paper that I'm, I've written about like how we approach this work. Um, it the the title of the board is Afrofuturism, Climate Justice, and Design, and it is a interactive literature review, um, but also um, examples of student work um, that has resulted from these exercises. So if you visit that board, you'll see there's two different um, columns um, towards the bottom. The, the, the top part is just consider that like a, like a, a collection of uh, visual um, literature. And um, the paper at the top is a draft that I'm actually replacing this weekend. Um, but the left-hand side is the, what we just did. It's like a, a more richly formatted version of this world building game with video references for some of the people that have been very influential in the original game design, which was the Afro-Rhythms of the Future, but, um, and then, you know, sort of art, and then instructions. Um, and then, you know, a, a, a list of cards that we've just sort of generated, and all of those are sort of adaptive and customizable. And um, on the right-hand side is the ethical framework that we've also worked, used. So what we've had students do is there's an expanded version of this, and we're as opposed to building a world, they are describing a world. Um, so, um, Cus, if you go down to the pink column um, and sort of, sort of zoom in on uh, the student work that is um, just below that blue box, um, keep scrolling down. I'll show you sort of like what that looks like. So, scroll in, zoom into any of those. Um, so, the students will watch um, a piece of climate fiction. So, I, the, the, this is from my, my sustainability classes. And so, they'll watch climate fiction. So, they watch some like far fetched version of, of, of a world that's post apocalyptic, essentially. Um, and then they are doing it's essentially like a book report, but it's a movie report. So, they're using it as a book report and they're looking to see if they can, they can identify the tensions that exist, like in the movie. And like, what are some of the key plot points? But then what are these um, artifacts or these props or obelisks or whatever that exist in the movie that seem to capture those tensions? And then what, what do you think inspired them? So like in watching the movie, um, we we're on uh, the, what's the train one? I can't remember it, the movie, a Snowpiercer, right? So they watch Snowpiercer as a group. They're talking about it. They're sort of pulling it up. But the one that I gravitates for me is the protein bars which were nutritious, like, you know, in terms of like their design, as an object of design, they're designed to like, it reminds me of like a protein bar, which I love, but they're made out of insects. And we were talking about like, what is the future of food? And the future of food can be things like, you know, uh, you know, an in insect as like protein source. So I think that when we talk about that, it sounds great. It's that there's this made out of cockroaches, which they discover, and I'm sorry to spoil it for you, but, um, it, it, as an object of discourse, it becomes this conversation about like, well, technically it's, technically it's good for you, right? Um, and it's recycled and it's sustainable and it's all these things and how does that show up? Um, so look, you can look through that and feel free to like um, explore it. And I would love to hear your feedback. If there are any, is there a question or two before people leave, I have a few minutes, but if not, then have a great rest of your Thursday. Yeah, before we open that up, thank you, Raja, for accepting the invite and uh, challenging the, the fishbowl construct and bringing your uh, world big, uh, building game to Agitari and sharing it with us. So thank you so much. Yeah, um, I really appreciate being here. Thanks for the invitation. It's really nice to um, 
it's always, I love playing this game yeah. with different people and it's always a different result, even with the same tensions and objects. So for me, it's just, it, as a designer, like I just like new ideas. So thank you for sharing your imaginations with me. Absolutely. Well, and I put my email in chat. If you didn't see it, these guys can get us together. We really have to connect because you should come play in the threat casting space. You'd have a lot of fun. I would love to do that. <laughs> yeah. I would love it. Yes. Yeah. And um, we I, are um, also the cat died for me because my oh, computer here, I'll just do it again. I can do it really quick. I don't have to run. Oh, yeah. So, um, and also heads up to everybody. So we're going to, um, we're going to be doing a bunch of future casting too. So we just opened our applied futures lab and the website we had up and then it's down again. <laughs> so it's just under construction, universities, you know. So, but that's going to be fun too, because we're going to need people in on doing some enabling futures instead of just threats all the time. So coming soon. So do reach out to me because I'd love to anybody reach out to me. There's my email if you ever want to play in some threat casting space. Um, we're also always looking for generous practitioners like yourselves who would be willing to um, work with on the workshops for, with our students because we have capstones, PhD, masters, all the students. And when they run their exercises, it's y'all are so much more generous than so many in the field. So it ends up being really rewarding for them. So thank you, thank you. This was so much fun, I loved it. And thanks guys for always having me. It's, it's a good time. Yeah, thanks for showing up, Cindy. Nice to meet you, Cindy, and thanks for your participation. Yeah, see you later. All right, bye. So glad we made that connection. You and Cindy are going to go off into some threat casting, world building, futuristic Man, stuff. I together. love avoiding disaster. <laughs> I love I love near misses. Like that to me, like that tension of like, oh, whew, is my favorite. <laughs> so I did want to just thank Rebecca for, for joining us. Also, you guys for for making the the fishbowl happen once again. Yeah, I think we lost Dan, but what he was saying is. Uh, we will put this up on YouTube um, and share it. If the first time I saw the session, I was like, we got to share this with more people. Um, and, and this time I had the same thought was mostly we don't really think like about the constraints we're designing in. Like what is this world and what are the large kind of drivers of conditions and how do the things we're putting into that environment like interact with those, with those constraints. And I think that by building an ultimate world in which you design something, then you think much more deliberately about those, those second order effects. And, it, and it's, it's one reason why I, I love this game and I love your intro to it. And I'm, I'm just super excited to, to have you and, and, and add this to our catalog of methods that we're, we're, we're proponents of uh, with, you know, within the Agitar community. Yeah, and, I, and I'm also really curious again how if you're as you're adapting it, like if you add more parameters, you know, like and, and I think you know for the real design, you know, it is the parameters are endless, right? You know, we're always drilling into the standards and parameters and best practices and how and you know testing them. But I think as a just as a starter, you know, I'm also I'm curious how how complex is too complex? What sort of like topics or things seem to be like hand like you should not touch because they're like you know hot potatoes or because then are they in this like fictional world does it not matter as much you know people feel for free and I'm, I'm always those are the kind of things like well, that, that's yeah that's what i had I, I had such a awesome time talking to you uh, prepping for this because you know one of the things we talked about was you know this is we're entering the defense space agitary you know we are in the dud innovation space and that's uh, what we all do um and so we talked about some topics that might get people to not speak up but then, then I started to kind of scratch my head a little bit, right? When our conversation, I'd saying, well, maybe that's the point. And then if we design, if we're creating this alternate world, this futuristic world, that's not our current world, then we can critique that world to a higher degree because it's not real, right? And so our, our biases and our maybe political stances don't apply to that. So then are not gonna correlate to you know how we design it uh, yeah and also i think that 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 moment of pause where you have to come to that shared understanding of what that even means you know and because something about co-creating that 
at that moment also helps with that conversation that makes it apolitical in a way and more just, you know, it, it's just, it's about our community trying to figure out like what it even is, you know, and right. whose values. And suddenly you're hearing about values um, as opposed to, values are like, you know, concerns as opposed to like just political things, which and I feel like it becomes artificial. We always talk about like this idea that binary is artificial. Like there's, there is no black and white. Every, it's all shades of gray and we really have to get comfortable with that. First of all, um, thank everyone for coming to the workshop today. I had a lot of fun playing this game and I can't um, leave this session without thanking my colleague and like my like my most valuable teammate, Chris Faiza, who is a professor at Drexel and is the program director for the design and merchandising program. Uh, our, our conversations about the ethics of the work that we do and the way that we teach and the way that we practice and how it intersects society and the planet um, have been a source of inspiration for me. And the other um, people I wanted to thank were um, the Fathomers and the Afrofuturist podcast and Afrorhythms of the Future um, workshop that I attended, which really inspired um, this virtual game. I don't have access to the physical cards, but do look up um, the Afro Rhythms. Uh, they, that group was the originator of this idea of taking Afro features and speculation and world building and making it a conversation and gamifying it for use in classrooms and workshops. And something they prototyped about a year ago and we're planning to sort of disseminate to the rest of the world. And then, um, you know, two of the people behind that were Ahmed Best, who um, runs Afro Futures podcast, along with um, Dr. Lonnie Abi Brooks, um, who's a professor of design and Afrofuturist and a scholar. Um, and I do think their work is just instrumental in thinking about radical ways that we can use design for transformation. So thank you all for, and I wanted to also mention I, at Drexel University, I um, am the co-chair for the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion um, a Council for IDSA, which is my professional organization, Industrial Designer Society of America. Um, and I also advise a number of community groups that are committed to diversifying um, design, including um, Diversified by Design, DXD, um, and then uh, Where are the Black Designers? So thank you all for attending today.